Hello again everyone and welcome back to the Underground. This is the Intel update for the 17th of February 2023 and as usual it is being recorded on the day prior on the 16th. Has anybody else noticed that it seems like these days we have far less time when covering an incident before the propaganda efforts seep in? It used to be we had quite a bit of time before the gaslighting kicked in and our reasonable certainty as to what was going on was pretty good for a little while, but as time has gone on, much like with any incident in the world these days, we reach a point at which the propaganda and misinformation become too thick for us to get through and we just kind of stall. And that is exactly what has happened with the airspace incursions that have happened as a result of the Chinese balloon incident. So be advised, I myself have far more questions than I have answers at this stage, but let's muddle through and cover what's happened so far. So here is an overview of all of the incidents that have happened so far, and let's take them one at a time. So first we have what we're calling Bandit 1, the hostile Chinese spy balloon that transited the uh, the entirety of the United States and was the cause of all of this uh, commotion regarding aerial uh, incursions. So that balloon was of course downed uh, off the coast of South Carolina on February 4th. We then have three other incidents and one anomaly to talk about. The next object that was shot down was Bogey 1, uh, which was an unidentified hostile object that was shot down off the northern coast of Alaska. Alaska on February 9th. A couple of days later, Bogey 2, another unidentified hostile object, was shot down over the Yukon Territory in Canada on February 11th. And finally, we have the last shootdown incident that has occurred so far, which was another hostile unidentified object that was shot down over Lake Huron on February 12th. Now, this last shootdown incident was very interesting and very illuminating as to the state of our national security. So let's talk a little bit more about that one by jumping to the East Central Midwestern region. The first detail I want to make sure that everyone is very aware of right up front is that there is a UXO hazard with this particular shootdown incident, uh, unexploded ordnance. So a total of two AIM-9X Sidewinder missiles were used to shoot down this balloon and two were needed because the first one missed and they don't know where it landed. So uh, the DOD is being again very evasive as to where uh, this missile may have landed because we don't know the trajectory, we don't know the, the flight path, we don't know which way the aircraft was, uh, what heading they were using to attack it, so we don't really know where it landed. The DoD says they think it might have landed in Lake Huron, but again, there could very well be uh, a, a missile laying on the ground somewhere in Canada or in Michigan or wherever uh, that has a high explosive warhead there. So just be aware of that if you're in the area. Uh, there's <laughs> the chances of finding it are pretty much zero, but the chances are never uh, exactly zero. So just be aware of that if you are in the area. The reason that this shootdown incident is uh, so concerning is because of the origin of Bogey 3 here. So to, to explain that a little bit, we have to jump to the western region uh, in which we have to talk about the anomaly that was detected in Montana. On the night of February 11th into the 12th, a radar anomaly was detected by NORAD. Uh, this anomaly was located just northwest of Billings, Montana. Again, same kind of area as the, the first balloon became observed by uh, civilians on the ground. And as a result, fighters were scrambled out of Portland to intercept this object, right? Uh, now, this is where we have a little bit of disconnect between what the DOD is saying and what local politicians said about this incident. So several politicians, local senators, congressmen, and as well as uh, some contacts in the governor's office, stated that this was not an anomaly. They knew exactly what it was and that it was actually an object. Uh, NORAD was very clear in that it was an object. And that NORAD communicated to the local politicians that... The fighters could not shoot it down in the dark, so they had to wait until it became daylight to engage. Now, just to pause for a moment, that part I'm not entirely sure about, because the munitions that we're using to shoot these things down, they work in the dark, right? They're using an infrared seeker. There's no problem with these uh, missiles being able to engage the target in the dark. Additionally, if there are any kind of ELINT collection uh, assets that are collecting intelligence on these objects, uh, they work in the dark as well. The only reason that the dark 
darkness might uh, play a factor into shooting down an object is identification. If the pilots want to make absolutely certain that they're shooting down a hostile balloon, they want to visually confirm that, and that might be a little bit harder to do in the dark. But either way, I find it very concerning that, well, one, darkness uh, is, is kind of a vulnerability for NORAD, it seems, uh, at least according to what local politicians were told, and also the fact that, again, this object was only located after it was well inside uh, American airspace, it, or, or so it seems. Now, the DoD's story as to what this anomaly was is very, very different. Uh, the DoD claims that they scrambled fighters out of Portland again, but when the fighters got on station, they didn't see anything at all. Uh, to use their words, they could not correlate uh, the object or, or, or any object with what they were seeing on radar. So the DoD says they didn't see anything at all. Now, the reason that we're talking about this anomaly is because we know from recent press conferences with NORAD and the DoD at large, uh, we know that this anomaly was most likely, almost certainly, Bogey 3, the one that was shot down over Lake Huron. So, the DoD claims, this is their own statement, that they lost radar contact of this object over Montana. They lost it and only reacquired this object once it was over Michigan, which is where we had a, a, the NOTAM pop-up first. So, with regards to Bogey 3, we actually had a NOTAM, a, a temporary flight restriction, a no-fly zone, uh, appear over parts of Lake Michigan. My guess is that's where they picked it up again and they immediately knee-jerk reaction issued a NOTAM to go intercept it because they had lost contact of it uh, as it was flying over roughly half the country. So my guess is they again knee-jerk reaction issued a NOTAM then realized oh, okay it's moving too fast for that NOTAM for that TFR so let's scramble again and let's see if we can intercept it over Lake Huron because we can't shoot it down over Michigan. So that's my guess as to what happened with this particular incident. Again I don't mean to gloss over the fact that it seems like the United States military and NORAD had lost a potentially hostile aircraft over American soil, and it was allowed to transit around half the country before it was uh, reacquired on radar. I don't know if that's true or not, because again, the DoD has been uh, confirmed to, to not tell the truth with regards to most details regarding these shoot-down incidents, but again, it doesn't look good uh, for the DoD to uh, lose a, a radar contact, especially one that could have been carrying uh, something more nefarious than cameras. So yeah, there are a lot of moving pieces with regards to these shoot-down incidents, and as you can imagine, I've been writing this brief for a few days now uh, as we get more information, but I've gotten to the point now to where I have so many questions that go unanswered that it's it's ridiculous. So I've built this uh, dedicated slide with regards to basically the unknowns as well as the counter-surveillance efforts that we are being seen uh, from the DoD to conceal these things and conceal the DoD's actions from the American public. Not so much the Chinese, because uh, the Chinese know exactly what we're doing, but they're more concerned about hiding these Chinese balloons from the American public than uh, concealing their existence from China. So, so to begin with this, let's go back and examine the very first incident, the very first balloon, the day, the minute, the hour, the second that we learned from NBC News that this uh, Chinese spy balloon was over Montana. So let's examine exactly how we found out about this first balloon. The DoD leaked to NBC News the initial report that a Chinese spy balloon was spotted over Billings, Montana. And this report was leaked within five minutes of people on social media taking pictures of the thing with their cell phones and wondering what is going on because they could see it from the ground. My question is again, how did the DoD know with such precision that people on the ground had seen the balloon? Well, my assessment is the DoD was surveilling us, specifically people in the area. My just gut assessment is that the Department of Defense and almost certainly federal agencies were surveilling people in that general area, people who might have been within line of sight of that balloon, and they were waiting for those people to see the balloon and freak out on social media before they leaked it. In other words, the DoD was trying to cover this up. We know from statements from uh, Biden's own staff that the DoD and the Biden regime was trying to hide hide this balloon. They were trying to hope that it would make it further into the United States before it was detected, and they were hoping that people just wouldn't even notice. Well, as we know, people in Montana actually did notice. This balloon was discovered as soon as it got near a decently populated area. So, again, the DoD was actively trying to conceal this balloon. By their own statements, they were trying to conceal it, because the DoD has stated, whether it's true or not, who knows, but they were tracking this thing when it took off from Hainan Island uh, weeks ago, and 
no one told us about it. They let it go all the way through Alaskan airspace, all the way through Canadian airspace, and it was only until civilians started freaking out about it did the DoD actually feel the need to let Americans know that there was a potential weapon inbound. This is something that we cannot forget. The DoD has been working against the American people since the very start of this incident, and that kind of flavors all of the other incidents that have occurred. So we, we can't trust the DoD. We've known this for many years, but now we cannot trust the DoD with regards to American airspace defense, which is a pretty serious thing. Something else to be aware of is the potential for NOTAMs or TFRs to be censored. Uh, like I mentioned with regards to the last shootdown incident, the most recent one, uh, there were two TFRs that were created. One was initially created over Lake Michigan, and then it just magically disappeared uh, from the FAA's website. Same thing with the one over Lake Huron. It appeared, and then it magically disappeared. Now, I don't know if that's because the NOTAM got canceled, because we don't know. It's like it never existed, right? Or if it's because the DoD realized that people like us have been tracking NOTAMs for a very long time. We even here have a whole dedicated video as to why it's important to track NOTAMs and TFRs and things like that. And my guess is the DoD realized that, oh, well, people are realizing where we're shooting these things down because, again, the DoD is trying to hide these things. They're shooting off explosives over our heads and they don't want us to know where that's happening. So they realize that the only way that we can track where these fighter jets are intercepting these things, because, again, the fighter jets are using, uh, they're not using their transponders uh, like, you know, it's pretty standard. But we can track where the fighter jets are generally by where the refueling tankers are and where the TFRs are located. So, Again, the DoD most certainly knows where these things are at, and they know we are watching them. Along the same front, I would expect in the future uh, the potential for shell games. The DoD or the FAA dropping multiple NOTAMs all around the country and citing them for national security purposes, right? And none of them are actually, there's nothing actually going on there. They're just used as a distraction to keep us from looking at the real area. So that's my guess as to what would happen next, is we start seeing false NOTAMs pop up, false TFRs, and really... There's nothing going on there. Really, the interception is happening somewhere else. Maybe not even underneath the NOTAM. We also have to remember that these last three incidents are not really confirmed uh, from a civilian perspective because we don't have video camera footage of these incidents, right? The one off of South Carolina, that shootdown incident, we've got a lot of cell phone you know, footage. We've got a lot of American citizens out there taking pictures of that and, and being aware that, that this uh, occurred. So we've got enough evidence to be reasonably certain that 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 balloon actually did exist, right? But the last three, we can't really be certain. The DoD has, again, not released any of the gun tape, and I highly doubt they're going to release it at all. In fact, the DoD started going with the narrative yesterday that the last three shootdown incidents, the one over Alaska, over Yukon, and over Lake Huron, were actually commercial balloons of a benign nature. So again, this goes back to what I mentioned at the very start of this, where we're starting to see the propaganda kick off again. Just right up front, I think that's a lie. I think these three balloons were most certainly Chinese in origin and were almost certainly carrying payloads or may have even jettisoned payloads uh, before they were intercepted by NORAD. Here's why I think that. The DoD is trying to run with a story that these were either weather balloons or commercial balloons. And the reason that I think that is pretty simple, at least with regards to weather balloons. What is the purpose of a weather balloon? Its job is to be released from the ground with a sensor package that uh, measures different kinds of attributes of of the atmosphere as it ascends up into the upper parts of the atmosphere, then uh, it, it pops and falls back down to Earth. Now, when it falls back down to Earth, it is almost never recovered by weather personnel, so it has to transmit that weather data back to the place that launched it as it is ascending through the atmosphere. Most weather balloons are airborne for about an hour and a half, sometimes, you know, less than an hour, depending on atmospheric conditions and how winds factor into that sort of thing. And they don't transit that far. Uh, maybe, you know, 100 miles, it's really hard to say, but here in the United States, they most certainly do not transit as far as Montana to Lake Huron. So let me explain what I mean by that. If the Department of Defense is trying to go with the story that the balloon they shot down, the object they shot down, over Lake Huron was in fact a weather balloon, then why did they confirm that they first acquired it on radar in Montana? There is no weather balloon that's going to be able to fly that far. I, at least I've never seen that. Weather balloons travel a pretty good ways, uh, but not that far, especially not while remaining.
remaining at 20,000 feet of altitude. You would expect that if the weather balloon was launched in like Wisconsin or even Michigan itself, uh, you know, weather balloon could, could easily get up that high. But here's the problem. Weather balloons are transmitting data. So anybody with a radio can intercept and detect weather balloon uh, message traffic. In fact, that's a pretty big sport throughout some parts of the world, mostly Europe, but here in the United States it's pretty common as well, for people to actually chase these weather balloons and, and recover uh, the payload when, uh, when it pops and falls back to Earth. It's kind of an interesting little hobby. You can even track weather balloons online because, <laughs> guess what, they're really easy to track because they're, of course, emitting their, their, their location as they are flying along. So I find it very, very hard to believe, in other words, it's impossible for me to believe that the DoD is going to shoot down a weather balloon without first checking whether or not that thing is emitting a signal that says, hey, I'm a weather balloon, don't shoot me down. Again, with the intense amount of surveillance that is going on with regards to these balloons, there is no way that the DoD is just popping commercial balloons. I mean, they had an AWACS up, they had an E3 Sentry up over this area tracking this object, and it is not possible for that asset to not know what this is. Okay, even the onboard sensors, onboard F-16s and F-15s and F-22s, they're onboard sensors can detect what this thing is, right? You can get a lot of fidelity on what an object is before you shoot at it. That would probably be a good idea, and it is. Uh, so that's why these sensors are implemented on pretty much all fighter aircraft that we use today. The other laughable story that the DoD, and the, actually it's the White House going with this story, is that these balloons may have been uh, bal balloons that broke away from used car lots or, or <laughs> car sales locations, you know where they have the big balloons, and uh, they broke away and and that's what these objects were. I think that's, again, pretty laughable, uh, considering the amount of surveillance that is going on around the United States. Again, I'm sorry that I don't have any clear-cut details, and all I can do is tell you my assessment on these things, because there really is no other information that we have. We're only getting the lie. We're not getting any details that we can really sink our teeth into and really start churning through the intel cycle and working on from a, you know, professional standpoint, there's really nothing we can do. We can only use gut assessment at this stage because we just have so few uh, real details. What do I think happened? I think these three balloons that were shot down, the one off of Alaska, the one in the Yukon, and the one off of Lake Huron, I think those three were probably Chinese spy balloons as well. Probably of a different make and model than the one that we all got spun up about, you know, the first time, but I think they were probably hostile balloons to start with, and the DOD is trying to save face in two different ways. One, the Department of Defense leadership is trying to conceal the fact that these are Chinese in order to protect China. Again, remember, Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is in the pocket of China, and I don't say that lightly. This dude freely admitted that he would call China in the event that the United States were to launch an attack on China. So he openly admitted to the world that he is compromised by China. On a side note, I wonder if old Mark got a phone call from his counterpart in China with regards to this spy balloon. Very interesting to find out. And let's not even talk about Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, and his intense money-making operation with regards to the military-industrial complex. Like, we've been following that for a very long time. So, again, our senior military leadership is most certainly financially motivated to protect China, also ideologically motivated to protect China, and also anyone who is underneath these guys, so like, we're saying like mid-level leadership at the Pentagon, these guys are motivated to save face because they lost a radar contact over American soil and now they have to make up for the embarrassment of that. And speaking of that, we are now seeing many different units and echelons and commands uh, throughout the United States and Canada declaring exercises. Yes, it is now time to save face for the DOD and to make up for the embarrassment that has been the, the constant story of the DOD over the past few weeks and months. Again, like I've said several times, I don't like, you know, ragging on the DoD just for the sake of ragging on the DoD, but they're making it really incredibly easy to do, right? Why is the DoD conducting these low-level drills in the capital region off the coast, you know, in, in these different strategic level commands? That's, you know, fine, all well and good. If they did, in fact, lose a radar contact over American soil, maybe they do need some practice. But uh, either way, why is the United States conducting these drills at home and not overseas? Why are we not seeing 7th Fleet get, getting spun up and, and running a, a carrier off the Chinese coast. We have we have literally conducted naval presence operations in the Pacific for a hangnail before, and yet we're not, or don't seem to be, doing that right now. What's up with that? So yeah, again, more questions than answers at this stage. 
Now, before we move on to more pressing matters in the United States, I do want to briefly talk about China for a second. Uh, China has, of course, been engaging their propaganda machines as well to spin the story. So the first thing they said was they detected a balloon in their airspace. So it was almost like, hey, look, guys, we've got one, too, so we're not spying on you, right? Uh, the next thing they said was they have detected over 10 incursions of their airspace uh, by American or otherwise unidentified spy balloons. I think they said over the past year or so. This, we know, is a blatant lie. And the re and this is a very interesting lie, actually, because because it's tailored, it is a lie that is tailored towards Americans who might not understand the Chinese method of warfare. A lot of people look at the United States and they look at China and they look at the military stuff that both of these nations are doing and we have a sort of false dichotomy uh, uh, coming about. Well, it's a little bit more complex than that. And I don't want to fall into the trap of trying to get into ideological debates over this kind of stuff, but th what I mean by all of this is that China's way of war is very different from the United States' way of war. A lot of people look at the United States and China as if it is the sort of relationship that existed between the United States and Russia during the Cold War, and that could not be further from the truth. The United States and China's relationship, uh, our, our international sort of arrangement, is much, much different than between the United States and Russia. We tend to forget that a lot of times because China is a very much a diplomatic mystery in, in many regards, especially militarily. Here's what I mean by that. The United States and Russia both claim roughly 12 miles of territorial waters, along with a couple of hundred miles of um, economic exclusion zone. We also claim 12 miles of airspace off of our coasts and things like that. The United States flies aircraft off of Russia's coast just outside of their uh, international you know, zone. They fly interceptors out just to make sure that we're staying outside of their zone, and they do the same to us. They fly bombers off of our west coast all the time, and they're like 12 and a half miles out, right? And we intercept them. And, and, you know, sometimes we, you know, keep up with international relations that way. And it's just kind of the way things have been since the Cold War. It is really just a holdover from the Cold War, but it's the way things have been for a very long time. China clearly is not playing by any of these rules. For one, China has uh, claimed roughly most of the Pacific, the entirety of the South China Sea, and most countries' airspace in the Pacific theater as their own airspace, right? So China's not just claiming, uh, you know, a tiny bit off their coast. No, they're claiming basically the entire South China Sea, a good portion of uh, most of the Pacific as well, right? Remember the whole Spratly Islands thing? They're claiming uh, waters that are hundreds of miles from their coast as their territorial waters. And just nobody's checked them on this uh, so far. Again, the fact that China is claiming that they have detected 10 different aircraft or hostile objects or whatever in their airspace too, that tells me for sure that that's a propaganda effort aimed at Americans who are not familiar with the Chinese way of war. China will shoot down aircraft outside of their airspace. If they think it's hostile and it's coming near their actual airspace, they'll shoot it down. You know, they clipped one of our aircraft, a uh, P-3 Orion that was conducting surveillance on them, but it was well outside of their airspace, and <laughs> that was the whole reason for the Hainan Island incident. So yeah, China is way more aggressive when it comes to their territorial claims and uh, territorial defense. Uh, than anybody else, especially the United States and Russia, right? Any other nation would have shot down an aircraft in their airspace long before it, it got to any kind of populated area. As soon as it entered the airspace, any other nation would have shot it down, right? And again, in sort of that same vein, we have to remember that self-defense is not escalation. People are, a lot of people are saying that, oh, okay, pointing out that these balloons are Chinese and pointing the finger at China is an escalation. Um, excuse me, no it's not. Uh, defending ourselves, defending our homeland is not an escalation. I don't care how many balloons or aircraft we have to shoot down, this is our home and we're going to defend it. Or at least I would hope that we do. Again, I don't mean to rant and rave too much, but I really want to make sure that these things don't slip into the memory hole, and there already are. We're already having a lot of details about these uh, shoot-down incidents slip into oblivion because the Super Bowl happened and everybody's just kind of getting back to normal life, uh, despite the fact that we've shot down four things in North American airspace uh, over the past couple of weeks. In a similar vein, I want to touch on a topic that has been kind of, well, really the bane of my existence for a while now, but it's the idea 
that a lot of people think that these incidents are purely distractions from any other incident that has occurred around the country, right? What's going all over social media, particularly amongst, uh, you know, conservative sources, is that these incidents, uh, the United States is shooting down weather balloons as a way of uh, distracting us from, you know, the Epstein client log, uh, client list becoming public, or uh, distracting us against, you know, egg shortages, or BlackRock, or something, right? And I'm not saying that these incidents, these shoot-down incidents, are not distractions. They are most certainly a distraction, but they're not only a distraction, right? We have to avoid getting into the mindset of thinking that every single incident is a distraction, because here's the thing. I don't want to get killed by a distraction, you know? These balloons are a violation of our airspace, and the DoD has been actively assisting them in letting them get as far as they possibly can over American soil, and we don't know what they have on board, because the DoD won't tell us, and even if they were to tell us, it's probably going to be a lie. So we have to take special care to make sure that we are treating these things with the proper level of... Uh, priority, I guess, uh, and granting these things the attention that they really deserve, we don't want to fall into complacency by thinking that very, very serious incidents are just distractions from something else, so they're not worth talking about. Yeah, sure, these actions are most certainly a functioning as a distraction, uh, but they are not only a distraction. Remember, everything is a balance, and things that are more important at the time get more attention at that moment. And if we have to shift priorities, we have to shift priorities. And speaking of shifting priorities, that is exactly what we're going to do when talking about this next topic. Once again, we're going to keep an eye out for other airspace incursions, even incursions that the DoD might not want us to know about. But we're also going to keep an eye on threats here at home that are more of a concern. And one of those concerns is the incident that has occurred in East Palestine. Ohio. Many of you have been following this crisis, particularly those of you who lived uh, who live in the area, so let's talk about it a little bit right now. On the 3rd of February, a large hazmat incident resulted from the derailing of a Norfolk Southern train, uh, which was mostly carrying toxic chemicals such as vinyl chloride. This train derailed in the vicinity of East Palestine, Ohio, and has since then become a rapidly developing scandal for many reasons. Uh, the two main reasons that this uh, scandal has has become a, a very high priority for people, you know, throughout the East Coast is due to two things. One, the hazardous nature of the cargo and the very shocking photos that we have seen uh, coming out of this incident, and also the very poor level of response that has been observed uh, throughout the area. So what I mean by that is we've seen a lot of evidence or some signs appearing of cover-up operations. Uh, first of all, disaster officials in the area provided incorrect uh, data as to what was actually Actually on the manifest for that train, so that has only become public uh, as of a couple of days ago, I think. Also, the local EPA is saying that, you know, basically there's nothing wrong. Uh, this is perfectly fine, uh, even though people are exhibiting very serious uh, illnesses in the immediate area. We've got people uh, as far away as Canada who are reporting chemical smells throughout their, their neighborhoods. Again, the EPA said everything's fine, and they actually let uh, everyone back into the exclusion zone uh, after this incident uh, occurred, and they're saying that there's really nothing going on, even though they're currently testing all of the rivers and things like that uh, for chemicals leaching into the local water supply. I can't really go into much more detail regarding the actual hazardous nature of the cargo. There are far more uh, better equipped people out there to discuss hazmat than, than myself, but I can comment on the second and third order effects. And the second and third order effects are often forgotten. So this particular section of rail line was a very, very busy section of the Midwest Northeast route. I'm seeing reports uh, from rail rail spotters that uh, this section of track uh, has up to 80 different trains a day. Uh, so it's, it's a very busy section of track. So when this derailing incident occurred, it took a main line down for a long period of time, right? So all of that traffic that was on that main line had to be diverted to other uh, rail lines in throughout the area. This, again, just creates the recipe for more disasters to occur in the adjacent areas because you've got a lot of congestion appearing on other lines throughout the area. So one rail line gets taken down, and now you've got six others that are now congested uh, past their, their limit, and this just creates a snowball effect for other bad 
bad things throughout the area. Now, fortunately, everything seems to have worked out okay, but, you know, we're not just talking about shortages that occur because trains are having to sit, you know, in sidings and wait their turn on the main line to transit through where they to where they need to go. We're not just talking about those shortages that might occur. We're talking about other accidents that might occur as well uh, from this congestion. So when these kinds of disasters occur, don't just look at the center of the bullseye, you know, of where this incident occurs. Look elsewhere as well. Keep an eye out for other incidents that might occur uh, as part of the second and third order effects. Now, before we move on, I wanted to briefly mention a, a small tidbit that might be very, very helpful for other people around the country who are interested in learning about indications and warnings of this kind of incident. Because I can tell you with pretty good certainty that if someone was paying attention and had had even just a cheap Baofeng in their hand, to listen uh, to a certain frequency, they may uh, have been able to uh, know about this incident many, many minutes before it occurred. Again, I have a dedicated episode on this coming out in the future, but I want to let the cat out of the bag now because it's very important for people to know, and that is railroad defect detectors. So, for those of you who don't understand how railroad operations work, despite what many of you might think, there are actually safety procedures in place to make sure something like this does not occur. And one of those little safety measures are what we call defect detectors. This is what most of them tend to look like. These are sensor packages that are arranged on a section of track, and their job is pretty simple. And these sensors are meant to do a variety of things. For one, they're meant to measure the temperature of wheels with infrared sensors to make sure that wheel bearings are not getting too hot. Also, count the number of cars and count the number of axles in a train to make sure that you're not leaving uh, something behind and, and that things are all good to go. Again, a supplementary safety method that is already kind of taken care of by other sensors but they're meant to do that as well. They're also meant to detect any equipment that might be dragging. Uh, so if you're dragging any kind of equipment, if some part falls loose or something and is kind of dragging on the track, it will trip a sensor and let the engineer know up front driving the train. So once a train has passed, a few seconds after that train passes, it will send a short uh, automated radio message uh, up and down the track uh, using a simple VHF uh, transmitter to the engineer up front. And it will let the engineer know if there is a problem. Now, anyone can listen to these messages. In fact, if you were to go to database.defectdetector.net, there is a nationwide map of all of these defect detectors. And if you wanted to, you can scroll in uh, to your home location and find the defect detector that is closest to you. These are usually arranged about every 20 miles on main lines, right? So you're not going to have them on every rail line, but they're fairly common. As you can see, they are all over the place. So what you can do is click this little uh, little icon here, and you can actually get the frequency that that particular defect detector is operating on. And if you were to take your radio and tune to that frequency, you can hear whether or not a defect is detected. And you can also know about trains that are passing by in your area. It's a pretty handy little OSINT method. And unfortunately, I think it probably would have helped out a lot of people know uh, about this derailing incident many, many miles before that derailing incident occurred because we now have footage from before the derailing incident that that indicates very strongly that one of the cars on that train uh, was on fire uh, prior to the derailing. So a defect detector, if it was functioning correctly, should have detected that and you should have spit out a radio message letting the engineer up front know that uh, uh, his bearings are hot and that there is a potential fire uh, on board uh, his train. So again, monitoring defect detector frequencies is a great way to kind of keep tabs on what's going through your area, particularly if you are uh, located next to a rail line which is extremely busy and is known to ship a lot of hazmat. It's just one of those things that you might be aware of. Now again, detecting a defect or hearing a, a message that says a defect has been detected, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a problem, but it's something that the train engineer should uh, be investigating. So again, it gives you kind of a heads up as to what's going on, um, and if you record that message, that could be pretty good evidence uh, for an investigation in the future. 
again, this is a really good use for one of those uh, old bow fangs if you uh, tend to get into communications and radios and things like that and uh, you decide to upgrade to, to a more uh, reliable uh, radio and you don't really want to use uh, your old school analog setup, you can just have it, you know, sitting sitting there on your desk uh, tuned to the right frequency and that's just a great way of using that. Again, we'll talk more about this in a dedicated video when we continue our SIGINT series, but I did want to mention it now because it's very pertinent and this could have been a way, if, it, if everything worked out right, it could have been a way to uh, let citizens know that something was going to happen long before it actually did. So, so yeah, that's pretty much all I have on this incident so far. And for, I wish I had more details on this, but I just don't really know. There's so much uncertainty with this because, again, I, there's just so little information and the information that's getting out there, it's almost like people don't really know what the actual risk of this situation is. It looks pretty bad and authorities telling people that there's you know nothing going on and that it's all perfectly fine is very hard to believe, especially by people who don't understand the, the chemistry of what's going on with these incidents here. I think that it's safe to assume so far that this incident is far worse than what the local authorities are you know, telling people. That is pretty much the case with every disaster, but especially this one. As to how bad it really is, I don't think anyone knows for certain right now, but it certainly cannot be good. So I think I'll just kind of leave it there, and we'll have to see how this situation develops over time. Uh, unfortunately, there really isn't a whole lot to know. We just don't know what the long-term effects of this are going to be, and we're just going to have to play it by ear uh, as we go on. So let's move on to, finally... Turkey. Now, this is an incident I've been wanting to cover for a while now since it actually occurred. On February 6th, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake uh, hit Turkey. Uh, it hit quite a few provinces, but it seems to be like most of the damage was confined to the area around Karaman Maras in the southern part of Turkey. Now, this is an especially devastating area because this is where millions of Syrian refugees are being housed and taken care of, where a lot of uh, NGO operations are set up uh, with regards to taking care of people who are trying to exfiltrate Syria as part of uh, the ongoing situation in that country. It's not normally a very densely populated area, but it is now and has become over the past uh, decade or so, I guess, as the situation in Syria has been generating a lot of refugees. So again, this is a very densely populated area now, and we are seeing reports of at least 40,000 uh, fatalities and tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of injuries. When it comes to large-scale uh, natural disasters like, like this one, it's really hard to get a feel for numbers uh, because, well, for one, it's Turkey, and Turkey's first response to this earthquake was to shut down Twitter uh, to make sure that Twitter was not accessible to those outside the country. So we had very little information as to what was going on uh, in Turkey follow the, for the first few days following this incident. So their, their first response was information control, right? Lock down the press kind of situation, which is what you would expect from uh, the government situation in Turkey. Uh, after after a few days uh, and through some diplomatic finagling, uh, Turkey actually opened up Twitter, so now we're getting a, a much more clear picture as to what's going on uh, in the disaster zone. But again, with numbers these large, 40,000 casualties potentially, uh, this is a horrific incident and we just cannot get an understanding of the true scale of this disaster. This is one of those disasters that is going to be felt for the next 10 to 20 years. Going to places like Nepal, and Haiti, we can see that earthquakes which occurred, uh, you know, sometimes over a decade ago, still are very much felt uh, in these regions. So this is most certainly going to be an enduring crisis for probably the next decade or so. For those who want to help with this crisis, uh, I'm afraid that there aren't too many different options out there. One of the groups that has been responding to this crisis is Team Rubicon. So if you want to check out Team Rubicon and the, and the fantastic work they've been doing uh, for many years now, please go check them out because they've got a lot of resources for those of you who are interested in helping out, not just internationally, but in your local area. Uh, but they, on their webpage, actually have a list of things that you can do to help the situation in Turkey. Now, it looks like there aren't too many options at this moment for those of you who are wanting to help, uh, because right now, like I mentioned, Turkey, this particular, this exact area was actually a regional hub for a lot of NGOs. So we're finding that a lot of the first responders are actually now victims of a natural disaster, right? Again, this complicates 
it's the whole response situation. But the Team Rubicon article actually points to the Turkish embassy, in which case it looks like most of the Turkish embassies and consulates uh, around the world, or at least in the United States, are getting set up to accept donations of goods and things like that. So you can follow those links below if you are interested in helping out that situation in Turkey. So that's pretty much all I have for today. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of those times where we have more questions than answers, uh, but I did want to make sure that everyone is aware of the current events that are occurring around the globe. Again, there are many more incidents that I have not covered today, but we'll be covering in depth in the future as soon as I get a little bit more information uh, regarding some of the things that have occurred over the past few weeks. So thank you all for watching, and thank you again to all of you for your support over the years. It really does mean a lot. And just like usual, keep your head on a swivel, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.